Hi everybody and uh, welcome to lesson six, um, where we're going to continue looking at training convolutional neural networks for computer vision. And uh, so we last looked at this, the lesson before last, and uh, specifically we were looking at how to train an image classifier to pick out breeds of pet, one of 37 breeds of pet. And we've gotten as far as training a model, but um, we also had to look and figure out what loss function was actually being used in this model. And so we talked about cross entropy loss, which is actually a really important concept, and some of the things we'll talk about today depend a bit on you understanding this concept. Uh, so if you were at all unsure about where we got to with that, go back and have another look, have a look at the questionnaire uh, in particular, and make sure that you're comfortable with cross entropy loss. If you're not, you may want to go back to the 04 MNIST basics notebook and remind yourself about MNIST loss because it's very, very similar. That's what we built on to build up cross entropy loss. So, uh, having trained our model, um, the next thing we're going to do is look at model interpretation. Uh, there's not much point um, having a model if you don't see what it's doing. And uh, one thing we can do is use a uh, confusion matrix, um, which in this case is not terribly helpful, there's kind of a few too many. I mean it's not too bad, we can kind of see some colored areas, and so this diagonal here are all the ones that are classified correctly. So for Persians there were 31 classified as Persians. Um, but we can see there's some bigger numbers here, like Siamese, six were misclassified, they're actually considered a, a Burman. Um, but for when you've got a lot of um, classes like this, it might be better instead to use um, the most confused method, and that tells you the combinations which it got wrong the most often. In other words, which numbers are the biggest? So actually here's the biggest one, 10. And that's confusing an American Pit Bull Terrier or a Staffordshire Bull Terrier. That's happened 10 times. And a Ragdoll is getting confused with a Berman eight times. And so I'm not a um, dog or cat uh, expert, and so I don't know what this stuff means. So I looked it up on the internet, and I found that American Pit Bull Terriers and Staffordshire Bull Terriers are almost identical, that I think they sometimes have a slightly different colored nose, if I remember correctly. And ragdolls and Burmans are types of cat that are um, so similar to each other that there's whole long threads on cat lover forums about is this a ragdoll or is this a Burman, and experts disagreeing with each other. Um, so no surprise that uh, these things are getting confused. So when you see your model making sensible mistakes, the kind of mistakes that humans make, that's a pretty good sign that it's picking up the right kind of stuff, and that the kinds of errors you're getting also might be pretty tricky to fix. Um, but you know, let's see if we can make it better. Um, and one way to try and make it better is to um, improve our learning rate. Uh, why would we want to improve the learning rate? Well, one thing we'd like to do is to try to train it faster, um, get more done in less epochs. And so one way to do that would be to call um, our fine-tune method with a higher learning rate. So last time we used The default, which I think is, there you go, 1 e neg 2. And so if we pump that up to 0 0.1, it's going to jump further each time. So remember the learning rate, uh, if you've forgotten this, have a look again at uh, notebook 4. Um, that's the thing we multiply the gradients by to decide how far to step. Uh, and unfortunately, when we use this higher learning rate, the error rate goes from 0.08 Three epochs to 0.83, so we're getting the vast majority of them wrong now. So that's not a good sign. So why did that happen? Well, what happened is rather than this gradual move towards the minimum, we had this thing where we step too far, and we get further, further away. So when you see this happening, which looks in practice like this, your error rate getting worse right from the start, um, that's a sign your learning rate is too high. So we need to find something just right. Um, not too small that we take tiny jumps and it takes forever, and not too big that we um, you know, either get worse and worse, or we just jump backwards and forwards quite slowly. 
So to find a good learning rate, we can use uh, something that uh, the researcher Leslie Smith came up with called the Learning Rate Finder. And the Learning Rate Finder um, is pretty simple. All we do, remember when we do uh, stochastic gradient descent, we look at one mini batch at a time, so a few images in this case at a time, find the gradient for that set of images for the mini batch, and uh, jump, step our weights based on the learning rate and the gradient. Um, well, what Leslie Smith said was, okay, let's do the very first mini batch at a really, really low learning rate, like 10 to the minus 7. And then let's increase um, by a little bit, so like maybe 25% higher, and do another step, and then 25% higher, and do another step. So these are not uh, epochs, these are just a single, a single mini batch. And then we can plot on this chart here, okay, at 10 to the minus 7, what was the loss? And at 25% higher than that, what was the loss? And at 25% higher than that, what was the loss? And so not surprisingly, if you do that, at the low learning rates, the loss doesn't really come down, because the learning rate is so small that these steps are uh, tiny, tiny, tiny. And then gradually, we get to the point where they're big enough to make a difference, and the loss starts coming down, because we've plotted here the learning rate against the loss. Right? So here the loss is coming down as we continue to increase the learning rate. The loss comes down until we get to a point where our learning rate's too high. And so it flattens out and then, oh, it's getting worse again. So here's the point above like 0 0.1 where we're in this territory. So what we really want is somewhere around here, where it's kind of nice and steep. Um, so you can actually ask it um, the learning rate finder, so we used LR find to get this plot, we can, um, we can get back from it the minimum and steep. And so steep is where was it steepest? So the steepest point was 5e neg 3, and the um, minimum point divided by 10, that's quite a, a good rule of thumb, is 1e neg 2. So somewhere around this range might be pretty good. Um, so each time you run it, you'll get different values. The different time we ran it, we thought that maybe 3 e neg 3 would be good, so we picked that. Um, and you'll notice the learning rate finder is a logarithmic scale. Be careful of interpreting that. So we can now rerun the learning rate finder, setting the learning rate to a number we picked from the learning rate finder, which in this case was 3 e neg 3. And we can see now that's looking good, right? We've got an 8.3% error rate after 3 epochs. So this idea of the learning rate finder is very straightforward, I can describe it to you in a couple of sentences, it doesn't require any complex math, and yet it was only invented in 2015, um, which is super interesting, right? It, it just shows that uh, there's so many interesting things for us still to learn and discover. I think part of the reason perhaps for this it took a while is that, you know, engineers kind of love using lots and lots of computers. So before the learning rate finder came along, people would lo like run lots of experiments on big clusters to find out which learning rate was the best, rather than just doing a batch at a time. Um, and I think partly also the idea of having a, a thing where a human is in the loop, where we look at something and make a decision, is also kind of unfashionable. A lot of uh, folks in research and industry love things which are fully automated. Um, but anyway, it's great we now have this tool because it makes our life easier. and um, uh, fast AI is certainly the first library to have this, and I don't know if it's still the only one to have it built in, at least to the basic, uh, the base library. So now we've got a good learning rate. Um, how do we uh, fine-tune the weights? So so far we've just been running this fine-tune method without thinking much about what it's actually doing. Um, but we did mention uh, uh, in chapter one, um, lesson one, briefly basically what's happening with fine-tune, what is transfer learning doing? Uh, and before we look at that, let's uh, take a question. Is the learning rate plot in LR find plotted against one single mini-batch? Um, no, it's not. It's just, it's actually just the standard um, kind of walking through the um, walking through the data loader, so just getting the usual mini-batches of the shuffled data, and uh, so it's kind of just tr normal training. 
And the only thing that's been different is that we're increasing the learning rate a little bit uh, after each mini batch and, and keeping track of it. Along with that um, is, is the network reset to the initial status after each trial? Uh, no, certainly not. We actually want to see how it, how it learns. We want to see it improving. Um, so we don't reset it to its initial sta state until we're done. So at the end of it, we go back to the random weights we started with, or whatever the weights were at the time we ran this. Um, uh, so what we're seeing here is, is something that's actually the, the, the actual learning that's happening as we at the same time increase the learning rate. Why would an ideal learning rate found with a single mini batch at the start of training keep being a good learning rate even after several epochs and further loss reductions? Great question. Um, it absolutely wouldn't. Um, so let's look at that too, shall we? Um, and oh, yeah, go on. Can I ask one more. Of course. Oh, this <laughs> um, is an important point. So ask us. It is. Yeah, this is very important. Uh, for the learning rate finder, why use the steepest and not the minimum? We certainly don't want the minimum, because the minimum is the point at which it's not learning anymore. Right? So, so the, this flat section at the bottom here means in this mini-batch it didn't get better. So we want the steepest because that's the mini-batch where it got the most improved, uh, and that's what we want. We want the weights to be moving as fast as possible. Um, as a rule of thumb though, we do find that uh, the minimum divided by 10 works pretty well. That's uh, Sylvain's favorite uh, approach, and he's generally pretty spot on with that. So that's why we actually print out those two things. Um, LR min is actually the minimum divided by 10, and steepest point is, suggests the steepest point. Great. Good questions all. Um, so remind ourselves what transfer learning does. So with transfer learning, remember what our neural network is. It's a bunch of um, linear models, basically, with, um, with activation functions between them. And uh, our activation functions are generally ReLUs, rectified linear units. If any of this is fuzzy, have a look at uh, the 04 notebook again to remind yourself. Um, and so each of those linear layers has a bunch of parameters. So the whole neural network has a bunch of parameters. And so uh, after we train a neural network on something like ImageNet, um, we have a whole bunch of parameters that aren't random anymore, they're actually useful for something. Um, and we've also seen that the early layers uh, seem to learn about fairly general ideas like gradients and edges, and the later layers learn about more sophisticated ideas like what do eyes look like, or what does fur look like, or what does text look like? So with transfer learning, we take a model, so in other words, a set of parameters, which has already been trained on something like ImageNet, uh, we throw away the very last layer, because the very last layer is the bit that specifically says which one of those, in the case of ImageNet, 1000 categories, um, is this an image in. So we throw that away, and we replace it with random weights, um, sometimes with more than one layer of random weights, and then we train that. Now, yes? Oh, I just wanted to make a comment, and that's that I think the learning rate finder, um, I think after you learn about it, the idea almost seems kind of so simple or approximate that it's like, wait, this shouldn't work, like, or, you know, shouldn't you have to do something more, more complicated or more precise that it's like, I just want to highlight that this is a very surprising result that some kind of a, a such a simple approximate method would be so helpful. Yeah, I, I would particularly say it's surprising to people who are not practitioners or who have not been practitioners for long. Um, um, I've noticed that a lot of um, my students at uh, USF have a tendency to kind of jump in to try to doing something very complex where they account for every possible imperfection from the start, um, and it's very rare that that's necessary. So one of the cool things about this is it's a good example of, of trying the easiest thing first and seeing how well it works. And this was a, a, a very big innovation when it came out, uh, that I think it's kind of easy to take for granted now, but this was... Uh, super, super helpful when it was uh, 
uh, kind of a new world. It was super helpful, and it was also nearly entirely ignored. Um, none of the research community cared about it, and it wasn't until Fast AI, I think, in our first course, talked about it that um, people started noticing. And we had quite a few years. In fact, it's still a bit the case where super fancy researchers still don't know about the learning rate finder, and you know, um, get get beaten by you know first lesson fast AI students on practical problems because they can pick learning rates better, uh, and they can do it without a cluster of thousands of computers. Um, okay, so transfer learning. So we've got our pre-trained network. And so it's really important, every time you hear the word pre-trained network, you're thinking a bunch of parameters which have particular numeric values and uh, go with a particular architecture like ResNet 34. Uh, we've thrown away the, the final layer and replaced them with random numbers. Um, and so now we want to train to fine-tune uh, this set of parameters for a new set of images, in this case pets. Um, so Fine-tune is the method we call to do that, and to see what it does, we can go learn.fine-tune question mark, and we can see the source code, and here is the um, signature of the function, and so the first thing that happens is we call freeze. So freeze um, is actually the method which um, makes it so only the last layer's weights will get stepped by the optimizer. So the gradients are calculated just for the, those last layers of parameters, and the step is done just for those last layer of parameters. Uh, so then we call fit, and we fit um, for some number of epochs, which by, def which by default is 1. We don't change that very often. Um, and what that fit is doing is it's just fitting those randomly added weights, which makes sense, right? They're the ones that are going to need the most work. Um, because at the time which we add them, they're doing nothing at all. Uh, they're just random. So that's why we spend one epoch trying to make them better. Um, after you've done that, you now have a model which is much better than we started with. It's not random anymore. Um, the, all the layers except the last are the same as the pre-trained network. The last layer has been tuned for this new data set. Um, so to avoid, the closer you get to the right answer, um, as you can kind of see in this picture, the smaller the steps you want to create, uh, sorry, the smaller the steps you want to take, generally speaking. So the next thing we do is we divide our learning rate by two, and then we unfreeze, so that means we make it so that all the parameters can now be stepped, and uh, all of them will have gradients calculated, and then we fit for some more epochs, and this is something we have to pass to the method. Um, and so that's now got to train the whole network. So if we want to, we can kind of do this by hand, right? And actually, CNN Learner will, by default, um, freeze uh, the model uh, for us, freeze the parameters for us. So we actually don't have to call freeze. Uh, so if we just c uh, create our learner and then fit for a while, this is three epochs of training just the last layer. And so then we can just manually do it ourselves, unfreeze. And so now at this point, um, as the question earlier suggested, maybe this is not the right learning rate anymore. So we can run LR find again, and this time you don't see the same shape. You don't see this rapid drop, because it's much harder to train a model that's already pretty good. But instead you just see a very gentle little gradient. So generally here, what we do is we kind of try to find the bit where it starts to get worse again, and go about, which is about here, and go about 10, you know, multiple of 10 less than that, so about 1 in neg 5, I would guess, which, yep, that's what we picked. So then after unfreezing, finding our new learning rate, and then we can do a bunch more, um, and so here we are, we're getting down to 5.9% error, which is okay, but there's, um, there's better we can do. And the reason we can do better is that at this point here, we're training the whole model at a 1e neg 5, so 10 to the minus 5 learning rate, which doesn't really make sense, because we know that the last layer is still not that great. It's only had three epochs of training from random, um, so it probably needs more work. 
Um, we know that the second last layer was probably pretty specialized to ImageNet and less specialized to pet breeds, so that probably needs a lot of work. Whereas the early layers, with kind of gradients and edges, probably don't need to be changed much at all. So what we'd really like is to have a small learning rate for the early layers and a bigger learning rate for the later layers. And this is something that um, we developed at FastAI, and we call it discriminative learning rates. Um, and uh, Jason Yasinski actually uh, uh, is a guy who wrote a great paper uh, that some of these ideas are based on, which is he actually showed that different layers of the network really want to be trained at different rates, although he didn't kind of go as far as trying that out and seeing how it goes. It was more of a theoretical thing. Um, so in FastAI, if we want to do that, we can pass to our learning rate, rather than just passing a single number, we can pass a slice. Now a slice is a special um, uh, built-in feature of Python. Um, it's just an object which basically can have a few different numbers in it. In this case, it's, we're passing it two numbers. And uh, the way we read those, um, basically what this means in FastAI as a learning rate is the very first um, layer will have this learning rate. 10 to the minus 6. The very last layer will be 10 to the minus 4. And the layers between the two will be kind of equal multiples. Uh, so they'll kind of be equally spaced learning rates from the start to the end. So um, here we can see basically doing our kind of own version of a fine tune. We create the learner, we fit with that uh, automatically frozen version, uh, we unfreeze. Uh, we fit some more. And so when we do that, you can see this works a lot better. We're getting down to 5.3, 5 5.1, 5 5.4% error. So that's pretty great. Um, one thing we'll notice here is that we did kind of overshoot a bit. Um, it seemed like more like epoch number 8 was better. Um, so kind of back before, you know, well, actually, let me explain something about fit one cycle. So fit one cycle um, is a bit different to just fit fit. So what fit one cycle does is it actually starts at a low learning rate. Um, it increases it gradually for the first one third or so of the batches until it gets to a high learning rate, the, the highest, the, the, this is why this is called LR max, it's the highest learning rate we get to. And then for the remaining two thirds or so of the batches, it gradually decreases the learning rate. And the reason for that is just that, uh, well largely it's kind of like empirically, um, researchers have found that works the best. In fact this was developed again by Leslie Smith, the same guy that did the learning rate finder. Again it was a, a huge um, step, you know, it, it really dramatically accelerated the speed at which we can um, train neural networks and also made them much more accurate. And again the um, academic community basically ignored it. Um, in fact the, um, the key publication that developed this idea was not even um, did not even pass peer review. Um, and so the reason I mention this now is to say that we can't, we don't really just want to go back and pick the model that was trained back here, um, because we could probably do better because we really want to pick a model that's got a low learning rate. So what I would gen generally do here is I'd change this 12 to an 8, because this is, this is looking good, and then I would retrain it from scratch. Uh, I'd normally you'd find a better result. Um, you can plot the loss, and you can see how the training and validation loss um, moved along. Um, and you can see here that um, you know the the error rate uh, was starting to get worse here. Um, and what you'll often see is often the validation loss will get worse a bit before the um, error rate gets worse. We're not really seeing it so much in this case, but the error rate and the validation lo loss don't always, or they're not always kind of in lockstep. So what we're plotting here is the loss, but you actually kind of want to look to see mainly what's happening with the error rate, because that's actually the thing we care about. Remember the loss is just like an approximation of what we care about that just happens to um, have a gradient that works out nicely. So um, how do you make it better now? Um, we're, we're already down to just uh, 5.4, uh, or if we'd stopped a bit earlier, maybe we could get down to 5.1 or less uh, error. On 37 categories, that's pretty remarkable. That's a very, very good 
um, pet breed predictor. Um, if you want to do something even better, you could try creating a deeper architecture. So a deeper architecture is just literally putting more um, uh, pairs of non uh, activation function, also known as a nonlinearity, followed by these little linear models, put more pairs onto the end. And the, basically the number of these um, sets of layers you have is the number that you'll see at the end of an architecture. So there's ResNet 18, ResNet 34, ResNet 50, so forth. Um, having said that, you can't really pick ResNet 19 or ResNet 38. Um, I mean, you can make one, but um, nobody's created a pre-trained version of that for you, so you won't be able to do any fine-tuning. Um, so like you can theoretically create any number of layers you like, um, but in practice, uh, most of the time you'll want to pick a model that has a pre-trained version. So you kind of have to select from the sizes people have pre-trained. And there's nothing special about these sizes, they're just ones that people happen to have picked out. Um, for the bigger models, there's more parameters and more gradients that are going to be stored on your GPU, and you will get used to the idea of seeing this, um, this error, unfortunately, out of memory. So that's not out of memory in your RAM, that's out of memory in your GPU. Cruder is referring to the language and uh, the system used for your GPU. So if that happens, um, unfortunately you actually have to restart your notebook. So that's a uh, kernel, restart, and try again. And that's a really annoying thing, but such is life. Um, one thing you can do if you get an out of memory error is after you've, you'll see an end learner call, add this magic incantation to FP16. Um, what that does is it uses for most of the operations um, numbers that use half as many bits as usual, so they're less accurate. Is half precision floating point or FP16, um, and um, that will use less memory. And on pretty much any uh, NVIDIA card created in 2020 or later, um, and some more expensive cards even created in 2019, um, that's often going to result in a, a two to three times speed up um, in terms of how long it takes as well. So here, if I add in to FP16. Um, then I will be seeing um, uh, often much faster training. And in this case, what I actually did is I switched to a ResNet 50, which would normally take about twice as long, and my e per epoch time has gone from 25 seconds to 26 seconds. So the fact that we used a much bigger network uh, and it was no slower is thanks to 2FP16. Um, but you'll see our error rate hasn't improved. Um, it's pretty similar to what it was. Um, and so it's important to realize that just because we increase the number of layers, it doesn't always get better. Um, so it tends to require a bit of ex experimentation to find um, what's going to work for you. And of course, don't forget, the trick is use small models for as long as possible um, to do all of your cleaning up and testing and so forth, and wait until you're all done to try some bigger models, because um, they're going to take a lot longer. A question, uh, Okay, Jeremy. questions. How do you know or suspect when you can, quote, do better? Uh, you have to always assume you can do better, <laughs> um, because you never know. Um, so you just have to, I mean, part of it though is, do you need to do better? So do you already have a good enough result to, to handle the actual task you're trying to do? Um, often people do spend too much time fiddling around with their models rather than actually trying to see whether it's already going to be super helpful. Um, so th as soon as you can actually try to use your model to do something practical, the better. Um, but yeah, how much can you improve it? Um, who, who knows? Um, I, you know, go through the techniques that we're teaching in this course and try them and see which ones help. Um, and unless it's a problem that somebody has already, already tried before and written down their results in a, in a paper or a Kaggle competition or something, there's no way to know um, how good can So don't forget, after you do the questionnaire, to check out the further research section. Um, and one of the things we've asked you to do here is to read a paper. So find the Learning Rate Finder paper and read it, and see if you can 
kind of connect what you read up to the things that we've learned in this lesson and see if you can maybe even implement your own learning rate finder um, you know as, as, as manually as as you need to and uh, see if you can get something that you know based on reading the paper you can get to work yourself uh, you can even look at the source code of fast AI's learning rate finder of course and then can you make this classifier better um, and so this is further research, right? So maybe you can start doing some reading to see what else could you do. Um, have a look on the forum, see what people are trying. Have a look on the book website um, or the course website um, to see what other people have achieved and what they did and play around. Um, so we've, we've got some tools in our toolbox now for you to experiment with. So that is, um, that is pet breeds. That is a, uh, you know, a, a pretty tricky um, computer vision classification problem. Uh, and we kind of have seen most of the pieces of what goes into the training of it. We haven't seen how to build the actual architecture. But other than that, we've, we've kind of worked our way up to understanding what's going on. So let's build from there um, into another kind of um, data set, uh, one that involves multi-label classification. So what's multi-label classification? Um, well, maybe so. Maybe let's look at an example. Um, here is a multi-label data set where you can see that it's not just one label on each image, but sometimes there's three: bicycle, car, person. I don't actually see the car here. I guess it's being popped out. Um, so a multi-label data set is one where um, you still got one image per row, but you can have uh, zero, one, two, or more labels per row. So we're going to have a think about and look at how we handle that, but first of all, let's take another question. Is dropping floating point number precision, uh, switching from FP32 to FP16, have an impact on final line? Yes, it does. Um, often it makes it better, um, believe it or not. Um, it seems like you know the kind of it, it it's doing a little bit of rounding off is one way to think of it drop some of that precision and so that creates a bit more um, bumpiness a bit more uncertainty a bit more you know of a stochastic nature and you know um, when you introduce more slightly random stuff into training it very often makes it a bit better and so yeah FP sixteen training often gives us a slightly better result but I you know. I wouldn't say it's generally a big deal either way, and certainly it's not always better. Would you say this is a bit of a pattern in deep learning? Less, uh, less exact and stochastic way? For sure, not just in deep learning, but machine learning more generally. Um, you know, there's been some interesting research looking at like matrix factorization techniques, which if you want them to go super fast, you can use lots of machines, you can use randomization. Um, and you often, when you then use the results, you often find you actually get better, better outcomes. Just a brief plug for the fast AI computational linear algebra course, which talks a little bit about, about random. Does it really? Well, that sounds like a fascinating course. And look at that, it's number one hit here on Google, so easy to find. Taught by somebody called Rachel Thomas. Hey, that's, that person's got the same name as you. Rachel Thomas. <laughs> um, all right. So how are we going to do multi-label classification? So let's look at a data set called Pascal, which is a pretty famous data set. We'll look at the version that goes back to 2007, been around for a long time. And uh, it comes with a CSV file, which we will read in. CSV is comma-separated values. And let's take a look. Um, each row has a file name, um, one or more labels. And something telling you whether it's in the validation set or not. So the list of categories in each image is a space gene limited string. So it doesn't have a horse person, it has a horse and a person. Um, PD here stands for pandas. Um, pandas is a really important library for um, any kind of data processing and you use it all the time in machine learning and deep learning, so let's have a quick chat about it. Um, not a real panda, um, it's the name of a library, uh, and it creates things called data frames. That's what the DF here stands for. 
And a data frame is a table containing rows and columns. Um, pandas can also do some slightly more sophisticated things than that, but we'll treat it that way for now. So you can read in a data frame by saying pd for pandas, pandas read csv, give it a file name, you've now got a data frame you can call head to see the first few rows of it, for instance. A data frame has a iloc, integer location, um, uh, property which you can index into as if it was an array, in fact it looks just like numpy. So colon means um, every row, remember it's row comma column, and zero means zeroth column, and so here is the first column of the data frame. Uh, you can do the exact opposite, so the zeroth row and every column uh, is going to give us the first row, and you can see the row has column headers and values, so it's a little bit different to NumPy. And remember, if there's a comma colon or a bunch of comma colons at the end of a indexing in NumPy, or PyTorch or Pandas, whatever, you can get rid of it, and these two are exactly the same. Um, you could do the same thing here by grabbing the column by name. The first column is f name, so you can say df f name to get that first column. Uh, you can create new columns. So here's a tiny little data frame I've created from a dictionary, um, and I could create a new column by, for example, adding two columns. And you can see there it is. So it's like a lot like NumPy or PyTorch, um, except you have this idea of kind of rows and and column named columns, and so it's all about um, this kind of tabular data. Um, I find its API pretty unintuitive, a lot of people do, um, but it's fast and powerful, um, so it takes a while to get familiar with it, but it's worth taking a while. And the creator of Pandas wrote a fantastic book called Python for Data Analysis, um, which I've read both versions and I found it fantastic. It doesn't just cover pandas, it covers other stuff as well, like IPython and um, NumPy and Matplotlib, uh, so highly recommend this book. This is our table. Um, so what we want to do now is construct um, uh, data loaders that we can train with. Um, and we've talked about the data block API as being a great way to create data loaders. So let's use this as an opportunity to create a data, data loaders or a data pro so create a data block and then data loaders for, for this. Um, and let's try to do it like right from square one. So let's see exactly what's going on with a data block. So first of all, let's remind ourselves about what a data set and a data loader is. A data set is an abstract idea of a class. Uh, you can create a data set. A data set is anything which you can index into it, like so. Or, and you can take the length of it, like so. So for example, the list of the lowercase letters, along with a number saying which lowercase letter it is, I can index into it to get 0, a, I can get the length of it to get 26, and so therefore this qualifies as a data set. And in particular, data sets normally you would expect that when you index into it, you would get back a tuple, um, because you've got the independent and dependent variables. Not necessarily always just two things, there could be more, there could be less, um, but two is the most common. So once we have um, a data set, we can pass it to a data loader. We can, repress, we can request a particular batch size, we can shuffle or not, and so there's our data loader from A, we could grab the first value from that iterator, and here is the shuffled 7 is h, 4 is e, 20 is u, and so forth. And so I remember a mini batch has um, a bunch of a mini batch of the independent variable and a mini batch of the dependent variable. Um, if you want to see how the two correspond to each other, you can use zip. So if I zip passing in this list and then this list, so b0 and b1, you can see what zip does in Python is it grabs one element from each of those in turn and gives you back the tuples of the corresponding elements. Um, since we're just passing in all of the elements of b to this function, um, Python has a convenient shortcut for that, which is just say star b. And so star means insert into this parameter list each element of b, just like we did here. So these are the same thing. So this is a very handy idiom. 
uh, that we use a lot in Python, zip star something, is kind of a way of like transposing something from one orientation to another. Um, all right, so we've got a data set, we've got a data loader, um, and then what about data sets? Uh, well, data sets is an object which has a training data set and a validation set data set. So let's look at one. So normally, you don't um, start with kind of an enumeration like this, like with with an independent variable and a dependent variable. Normally, you start with um, uh, like a file name, for example, um, and then you you kind of calculate or compute or transform your file name into an image by opening it, and a label by, for example, looking at the file name and grabbing something out of it. So for example, we could do something similar here. This is what datasets does. So we could start with just the lowercase letters. So this is still a dataset, right, because we can index into it, and we can get the length of it, although it's not giving us tuples yet. So if we now pass that list to the datasets class and index into it, we get back the tuple. And it's actually a tuple with just one item. This is how Python shows a tuple with one item, is it puts it in parentheses and a comma and then nothing. Okay. So in practice what we'd really want to do is to say like, okay, we'll take this and uh, do something to compute an independent variable and do something to compute a dependent variable. So here's a function we could use to compute an independent variable, which is to stick an A on the end, and our dependent variable might just be the same thing with a B on the end. So here's two functions. So for example, now we can call datasets, passing in A, and then we can pass in a um, list of transformations to do. And so in this case I've just got one, which is this function, add an A on the end. So now if I index into it I don't get A anymore, I get AA. Uh, if you pass multiple functions, then it's going to do multiple things. So here I've got F1, then F2, AAB. Adds this one, then adds this one. And you'll see this is a list of lists, and the reason for that is that you can also pass something like this, a list containing F1, a list containing F2, and this will actually take each element of A, pass it through this list of functions, and there's just one of them to give you AA, and then start again and separately pass it through this list of functions, there's just one, to get AB. And so this is actually kind of the main way we build up uh, independent variables and dependent variables in fast AI, is we start with something like a file name, and we pass it through two lists of functions. One of them will generally kind of open up the image, for example, and the other one will kind of parse the file name, for example, and give you an independent variable and a dependent variable. So you can then create a data loaders object from datasets by passing in the datasets, and a batch size, and so here you can see I've got shuffled O A I A etc. O B I B etc. So this is worth studying to make sure you understand what data sets and data loaders are. Um, we don't often have to create them from scratch. We can create a data block to do it for us. Um, but now we can see what the data block has to do. So let's see how it does it. So we can start by creating an empty data block. Uh, so an empty data block is going to take our data frame, so we're going to go back to looking at our data frame, which remember was this guy. And so if we pass in our data frame, um, we can now, we'll now find that this data block has created data sets, a training and a validation data set for us. Um, and if we look at the training set, it'll give us back an independent variable and a dependent variable, and we'll see that they are both the same thing. So this is the first row of the table that's actually shuffled, so it's a random row of the table repeated twice. Um, and the reason for that is by default, the data block assumes that we have two things, the independent variable and the dependent, or the input and the target, and by default it just copies. It just keeps exactly whatever you gave it. Um, to create the training set and the validation set, by default it just randomly splits um, the data uh, with a 20% validation set. So that's what's happened here. So this is not much use. Um, what, we, what we actually want to do, if we look at 
x, for example, is grab the, the, the f name, the file name field, because we want to open this image. That's going to be our independent variable. Um, and then for the label, we're going to want this here, person cat. So we can actually pass these as parameters, get x and get y are functions that return the, the bit of data that we want. And so you can create and use a function in the same line of code in Python by saying lambda. So lambda r means create a function, doesn't have a name, it's going to take a parameter called r, we don't even have to say return, it's going to return the f name um, uh, column in this case. And get y is something which is a function that takes an r and returns the labels column. So now we can do the same thing called dblock.datasets. We can grab a row from that, from the training set, and you can see, look, here it is. There is the image uh, file name, and there is the space delimited list of labels. So here's exactly the same thing again, but done with functions. Okay, so now the, the one line of code above has become three lines of code, but it does exactly the same thing. Okay. Uh, we don't get back the same result because um, the training set, well, wait, why don't we get the same result? Um, oh, I know why, because it's randomly shuffle, it's randomly picking a different validation set um, uh, because the random split is done differently each time, so that's why we don't get the same result. Um, one thing to note, be careful of lambdas. Um, if you want to save this data block for use later, you won't be able to. Python doesn't like saving things that contain lambdas. Um, so most of the time in the book and the course, we normally use avoid lambdas for that reason, because it's, it's often very convenient to be able to save things. Uh, we use the word here serialization. That just means, basically it means saving something. Um, this is not enough to open an image, because we don't have the path. Um, so to turn this into, uh, so rather than just using this function to grab the uh, f name column, we should actually use path lib to go path slash train and then column. Um, and then for the y, again, the labels is not quite enough. We actually have to split on space. But this is Python. We can use any function we like. And so then we use the same three lines of code as here. And now we've got a path and a list of labels. So that's looking good. Um, so we want this path to be opened as an image. So the data block API lets you pass a blocks argument where you tell it for each of the things in your tuple, so there's two of them, what kind of block do you need? So we need an image block to open an image. And then in the past we've used a category block for categorical variables, but this time we don't have a single category, we've got multiple categories, so we have to use a multi-category block. So once we do that, and have a look, we now have a 500 by 375 image as our independent variable. And as a dependent variable, we have a uh, long list of zeros and ones. The long list of zeros and ones is the labels as a one hot encoded vector, a rank one tensor. And specifically, um, there will be a zero in every location where, uh, in the vocab, where there is not that kind of object in this image, and a one in every location where there is. So for this one, there's just a person. So this must be the location in the vocab where there's a person. Do you have any questions? So one-hot encoding is a very important concept, and um, we didn't have to use it before, right? We could just have a single um, integer uh, saying which one thing is it. Uh, but when we've got lots of things, um, lots of potential labels, it's it's convenient to use this one-hot encoding, and it's kind of what it's it's actually what's going to happen with the uh, with the with the actual matrices anyway. When we actually uh, um, compare the um, activations of our neural network to the target, it's actually going to be comparing each one of these.
Um, okay, so the categories, as I mentioned, is based on the vocab. So we can grab the vocab from our dataset subject, um, and then we can say, okay, let's look at the first row, and let's look at the dependent variable, and let's look for where the dependent variable is 1. Okay, and then we can have a look, pass those indexes to the vocab, and get back a list of what it actually was there. And again, each time I run this, I'm going to get different results. Uh, so each time we run this, we're going to get different results, because I called .datasets again here, so it's going to give me a different train test split, uh, and so this time it turns out that this is actually a chair. And we have a question. Shouldn't the tensor be of integers? Why is it a tensor of floats? Yeah, conceptually this is a tensor of integers, they can only be 0 or 1. Um, but we, um, we're going to be uh, using a cross-entropy style loss function, um, so we're going to actually need to, to do floating point calculations on them. That's going to be faster to just um, store them as float in the first place rather than converting backwards and forwards. Even though they're conceptually an int, we're not going to be doing kind of int style calculations with them. Good question. Um, I mentioned that by default, uh, the um, data block uh, uses a random split. Um, you might have noticed in the data frame though, it said here's a column saying what validation set to use. And if the data set you're given tells you what validation set to use, you should generally use it, um, because that way you can compare your validation set results to somebody else's. Um, so you can pass a splitter argument, which again is a function, and so we're going to pass it a function that's also called splitter, and the function is going to return the indexes where it's not valid, and that's going to be the training set, and the indexes where it is valid, that's going to be the validation set, and so the splitter argument is expected to return two lists of integers. And so if we do that, um, we get again the same thing, but now we're using the correct train and validation sets. Another question? Sure. Uh, any particular reason we don't use floating point 8? Is it just that the precision's too low? Yeah, trying to train with 8-bit precision is super difficult. Um, because it's, um, it's so flat and bumpy, uh, it's pretty difficult to get decent gradients. Um, the, but you know, it's an area of research. The main thing people do with 8-bit or even 1-bit um, data types is they take a model that's already been trained with 16-bit or 32-bit floating point, and then they kind of round it off. It's called discretizing um, to create a kind of purely integer or even binary network, um, which can do inference much faster. Um, figuring out how to train with such low precision data is uh, an area of active research. I suspect it's possible, um, and I suspect, I mean, people have fiddled around with it and had some success. But I think, it, you know, it could turn out to be super interesting, particularly for stuff that's been done on like low powered devices that might not even have a floating point unit. Uh, right, so um, the last thing we need to do is to um, add our item transforms, random resource crop. We've talked about that enough, so I won't go into it, but basically that means we now are going to ensure that everything has the same shape so that we can collate it into a data loader. So now rather than going .data sets, go .data loaders and display our data. And remember if something goes wrong, as we saw last week, you can call summary to um, find out exactly what's happening in your data block. So now, you know, this is something really worth studying this section because data blocks are super handy, um, and if you haven't used FastAI 2 before, they won't be familiar to you because no other library uses them. Um, and so like this has really shown you how to go right back to the start and gradually build them up. Um, so hopefully that'll make a whole lot of sense now. Um, now we're going to need a loss function again. Um, and to do that, let's start by just creating a learner. 
Uh, let's create a ResNet 18 from the data loaders object that we just created. Um, and let's grab one batch of data, and then let's put that into our uh, mini batch of um, independent independent variables. And then learn.model is the thing that actually contains the, the, the model itself, in this case a CNN. And you can treat it as a function, uh, and so therefore we can just pass something to it. And so if we pass um, a mini batch of the independent variable to learn.model, it will return the activations from the final layer. And that is shape 64 by 20. So anytime you get a tensor back, look at its shape. And in fact, before you look at its shape, predict what the shape should be. Uh, and then make sure that you're all right. If you're not, either you guessed wrong, so try to understand what, why you made a mistake, or there's a problem with your code. In this yeah. case, 64 by 20 um, makes sense because we have a mini batch size of 64, and for each of those, we're going to make predictions about what probability is each of these 20 possible categories. We and have we have a question. Questions. Two questions. Two questions, all right. Is the data block API compatible with out of core data sets like Dask? Yeah, the data block API can do anything you want it to do. Um, so you're passing it, um, if we go back to the start. So um, you can create an empty one, and then you can pass it anything that is um, indexable. Um, and yeah, so that can be anything you, you like, and it, pretty much anything can be made indexable uh, in Python, and that, something like Dask is certainly indexable, um, so that works perfectly fine. Um, if it's not indexable, like it's a, it's a network stream or something like that, then um, the data loaders, data sets, APIs directly, which we'll learn about either in this course or the next one. Um, but yeah, anything that you can index into, which certainly includes Dask, um, you can use with data blocks. Next question, where do you put images for multi-label with that CSV table? Should they be in the same directory? Uh, they can be anywhere you like. Um, so in this case, we used a um, pathlib object like so. And um, in this case, the um, uh, the by default, um, it's going to be using. Let's think about this. So what's happening here is the path is oh, it's saying dot. Okay, the reason for that is that path dot base path is currently set to path, and so that displays things relative. So let's get rid of that. Okay, so the path we set is here, right? And so then when we said get x, it's saying path slash chain slash whatever, right? So this is an absolute path. And so here is the exact path. So you can put them anywhere you like, you just have to say what the path is. And then um, if you want to um, not get confused by having this big long prefix that we can don't want to see all the time, just set base path to the path you want everything to be relative to, and then it'll just print things out in this more, con more convenient manner. Right, so um, this is really important that you can do this, that you can create a learner, that you can grab a batch of data, that you can pass it to the model, this, this is just plain PyTorch, this line here, right, no fast AI. Um, you can see the shape, right, you can recognize why it has this shape. And so now if you have a look, here are the 20 activations. Now this is not a trained model, um, it's a pre-trained model with a random set of final layer weights. So these specific numbers don't mean anything, right? but it's just worth remembering this is what activations look like. And most importantly, they're not between 0 and 1. And if you remember from the MNIST notebook, we know how to scale things between 0 and 1 we can pop them into the sigmoid function. So the sigmoid function is something that scales everything to be between 0 and 1. So let's use that. You'll also hopefully remember from the MNIST notebook that the 
um, MNIST loss, um, uh, the MNIST loss uh, function first did sigmoid, and then it did torch dot where. Um, so and then it did dot mean. So we're going to use exactly the same thing as the MNIST loss function, and we're just going to do one thing, which is going to add dot log, uh, for the same reason that we talked about um, when we were looking at um, softmax. Um, we talked about why log is a good idea as a transformation. We saw in the MNIST notebook we didn't need it, um, but we're going to train faster and more accurately if we use it because it's just more, it's going to be better behaved as we've seen. So this particular function, which is identical to MNIST loss plus dot log, has a specific name and it's called binary cross entropy. And we used it for the threes versus sevens problem um, to, to decide whether that column is it a three or not. Um, but because um, we can use broadcasting um, in PyTorch and element-wise arithmetic, um, this function, when we pass it a whole matrix, is going to be applied to every column. So is the first column um, you know, so it'll it'll basically do a torch dot where on on every column separately and every item separately. Um, so that's great. It basically means that this binary cross entropy function is going to be just like MNIST loss, but rather than just being is this a number three, it'll be is this a dog? Is this a cat? Is this a car? Is this a person? Is this a bicycle? And so forth. So this is where it's so cool in PyTorch, we can kind of run write one thing and then kind of have it expand to handle higher dimensional tensors without doing any extra work. Um, we don't have to write this ourselves, of course, um, because uh, PyTorch has one, and it's called f.binarycrossentropy. So we can just use PyTorches. Um, as we've talked about, there's always a, a equivalent module version so this is exactly the same thing as a module, nn.bce loss. Um, and um, these ones don't include the initial sigmoid, actually. Um, if you want to include this initial sigmoid, you need f.binary cross entropy with logits, or the equivalent, nn.bce with logits loss. So bce is binary cross entropy. And so those are two functions plus two equivalent classes for uh, multi-label or binary problems. And then the equivalent for single label, like MNIST and PETS, is NLL loss and cross entropy. So that's the equivalent of binary cross entropy and binary cross entropy with logits. So these are pretty awful names, I think we can all agree. <laughs> um, but it is what it is. <laughs> um, so in our case, we have a one-hot encoded target uh, and we want the one with the sigmoid in, so the equivalent built in is called BCE with logits loss. So that we can make that our loss function, we can compare the activations to our targets, and we can get back a loss, um, and then that's what we can use to train. And then finally, before we take our break, we also need a metric. Now previously we've been using as a metric a accuracy, or actually error rate. Error rate is 1 minus accuracy. Accuracy only works for single label data sets like MNIST and PETS. Um, because what it does is it takes the input, which is the final layer activations, and it does argmax. What argmax does is it says, what is the index of the largest number? In those activations. So for example, for MNIST, you know, maybe the largest, the highest probability is 7, so this argmax would return 7. And then it says, okay, there's, those are my predictions, and then it says, okay, is the prediction equal to the target or not, and then take the floating point mean. So that's what accuracy is. So argmax only makes sense when there's a single maximum thing you're looking for. In this case, we've got multi-label. So instead, we have to compare each activation to some threshold. By default, it's 0.5. And so we basically say, if the sigmoid of the activation is greater than 0.5, let's assume that means that category is there, and if it's not, let's assume it means it's not there, 
And so this is going to get, give us a list of trues and falses for the ones that, um, the based on the activations it thinks are there. And we can compare that to the target. And then again, take the floating point mean. So uh, we can use the default threshold of 0 0.5. Um, but we don't necessarily want to use 0 0.5. We might want to use a different threshold. And remember, we have to pass, when we create our learner, we have to pass to the metric, uh, the metrics argument, a function. So what if we want to use a threshold other than 0 0.5? Well, we'd like to create a special function, which is accuracy multi, with some different threshold. And the way we do that is we use a special um, uh, built-in in Python called partial. Let me show you how partial works. Here's a function called say hello. Say hello to somebody with something. So say hello Jeremy, well the default is hello, so it says hello Jeremy. Say hello Jeremy, comma ahoy, it's going to be ahoy Jeremy. Let's create a special version of this function that will be more suitable for Sylvain. It's going to use French. So we can say partial, create a new function that's based on the say hello function, but it's always going to set say what to bonjour. And we'll call that f. So now f Jeremy is bonjour Jeremy, and f Sylvain is bonjour Sylvain. So you see we've created a new function from an existing function by fixing one of its parameters. So we can do the same thing for accuracy multi. So let's use a threshold of 0 0.2, and we can pass that to metrics. And so let's create a CNN learner. And you'll notice here we don't actually pass a loss function, and that's because FastAI is smart enough to realize, hey, you're doing um, a classification model with a, um, uh, a multi-label dependent variable, so I know what loss function you probably want. So it does it for us. So we can call fine-tune, and here we have an accuracy of 94.5 after the first few, and eventually 95.1. That's pretty good. We've got an accuracy of over 95%. Was 0.2 a good threshold to pick? Who knows? Let's try 0.1. Well, that's a worse accuracy. Um, so I guess in this case we could try a higher threshold, 94. Hmm, also not good. So what's the best threshold? Well, what we could do is call get preds to get all of the predictions and all of the targets, and then we could calculate the accuracy at some threshold. And then we could say, okay, let's grab lots of numbers between 0.05 and 0.95, and you, with the list comprehension, calculate the accuracy for all of those different thresholds, and plot them. Ah, looks like we want a threshold somewhere a bit above 0.5. So, cool, we can just use that, and it's going to give us 96 and a bit, which is going to give us a better accuracy. Um, this is a, um, you know, something that a lot of um, theoreticians would be uncomfortable about. I've used the validation set to pick a hyperparameter, a threshold, right? And so people might be like, oh, you're overfitting using the validation set to pick a hyperparameter. But if you think about it, this is a very smooth curve, right? It's not some bumpy thing where we've accidentally kind of randomly grabbed some, some unexpectedly good value. Um, when you're picking a single number, from a smooth curve, you know, this is where the theory of like, don't use a validation set for, for hyperparameter tuning doesn't really apply. So it's always good to be practical, right? Don't treat these things as rules, but as rules of thumb. Um, okay, so let's take a break for five minutes and we'll see you back here in five minutes time. All right, welcome back. So I want to show you something really cool. Image regression. So we are not going to learn how to use a fast AI image regression application because we don't need one. Uh, now that we know how to build stuff up with loss functions and the data block API ourselves, we can invent our own applications. So there is no image regression application per se. Um, but where you can do image regression really easily. What do we mean by image regression? Well, remember back to lesson, I think it was lesson one, we talked about the two basic types of 
machine learning um, or supervised machine learning. Uh, regression and classification. Classification is when our dependent variable is a, a discrete category or set of categories. And regression is when our dependent variable is a continuous number, like an age or x, y coordinate or something like that. So image regression means our independent variable is an image and our dependent variable um, is a um, continue, one or more continuous value, values. And so here's what that can look like, um, which is uh, the BWE head pose data set. Um, it has a number of things in it, but one of the things we can do is find the midpoint of a person's face. See. So the BWE uh, head pose data set. Uh, so the BWE head pose data set um, comes from um, this paper, Random Forest Real Time 3D Face Analysis. Uh, so thank you to those authors. Um, and um, we can grab it in the usual way, untar data, um, and we can have a look at what's in there. And we can see uh, there's 24 directories numbered from, to, from 1 to 24. There's 1, 2, 3, and each one also has a .obj file. We're not going to be using the .obj file, um, just the directories. So let's look at one of the directories, and as you can see there's a thousand things in the first directory. So each one of these 24 directories is one different person that they've photographed. And you can see for each person there's frame 3 pose, frame 3 RGB, frame 4 pose, frame 4 RGB, and so forth. So in each case we've got the image, which is the RGB, and we've got the pose, which is the pose.txt. So uh, as we've seen, we can grab, uh, use get image files to get a list of all of the files, image files recursively in a path. And so once we have an image file name, like this one, sorry, like this one, we can turn it into a pose file name by removing the last one, two, three, five, six, seven letters and adding back on pose.txt. And so here is a function that does that. And so you can hear, see I can pass in an image file to image to pose and get back a pose file. Right, so um, pilimage.create is the fast AI way to create an image, um, at least a PIL image. Um, it has a shape. Um, in computer vision, they're normally backwards. They normally do columns by rows, so that's why it's this way around. Um, where else PyTorch and NumPy tensors and arrays are rows by columns. So that's confusing, but that's just how <laughs> things are, I'm afraid. Um, so here's an example of an image. Um, when you look at the README from the dataset website, they tell you how to get the center point from um, from one of the text files, and it's just this function, so it doesn't matter. It just it is what it is. We call it get center, and it will return the x y coordinate of the center of the person's head uh, face. Um, so we can pass this as get y because get y remember is a thing that gives us back the label. Okay. So um, so here's the thing, right? Uh, we can create a data block. And we can pass in as the independent variables block, image block, as usual. And then the dependent variables block, we can say point block, which is a tensor with two values in. And now by combining these two things, this says we want to do image regression with um, a dependent variable with two continuous values. Uh, to get the items, you call get image files. To get the y, we'll call the get center function. Um, to split it, so this is important, we should make sure that the um, validation set contains one or more people that don't appear in the training set. So I'm just going to grab person number 13, just grabbed it randomly, and I'll use all of those images as the validation set. Because I think they did this with a Xbox Connect, you know, video thing. So there's a lot of images that look almost identical. So if you randomly assigned them, then you would be um, massively overestimating how effective you are. You want to make sure that you're actually doing a good job with a random, uh, with a new set of people, not just a new set of frames. 
So that's why we use this. And so func splitter is a splitter that takes a function, and in this case we're using lambda to create the function. Um, we will use data augmentation, and we will also normalize. Um, so this is actually done automatically now, um, but in this case we're doing it manually. So this is going to um, subtract uh, the the mean and divide by the standard deviation of the original data set that the pre-trained model used, which is ImageNet. Uh, so that's our data block. Um, and so we can call data loaders to get our data loaders, passing in the path and show batch, and we can see that looks good, right? Here's our faces and the points. And so let's like, particularly for, for as a student, don't just look at the pictures, look at the actual data. So grab a batch, put it into an XB and a YB, X batch and Y batch, and have a look at the shapes. And make sure they make sense. So why is this 64 by 1 by 2? Um, so it's uh, 64 in the mini batch, 64 rows. Um, and then a, um, the coordinates is a 1 by 2. Uh, tensor. So there's a, there's a single point with two things in it. It's like you could have like hands, face, and armpits, or whatever, or nose and ears and mouth. So in this case, we're just using one point, and the point is represented by two values, the x and the y. And then why is this 64 by 3 by 240 by 320? Well, there's 240 rows by 320 columns. That's the pixels. That's the size of the images that we're using. Mini batch is 64 items. And what's the three? The three is the number of channels, um, which in this case means the number of colors. Uh, if we open up some random grizzly bear image, and then we go through um, uh, each of the um, uh, elements of the first axis and do a show image, you can see that it's got the red, the green, and the blue as the three channels. So that's how we store a three-channel image, is it's stored as a three by number of rows by number of columns rank three tensor, and so a mini batch of those is a rank four tensor. So that's why this is that shape. So here's a row from the dependent variable, okay, and there's that x, y location we talked about. So we can now go ahead and create a learner, passing in our data loaders as usual, passing in a pre-trained architecture as usual, and if you think back, you may just remember in lesson one, we learned about Y range. Y range is where we tell FastAI what range of data we expect to see in the dependent variable. And so we want to use this generally when we're doing regression. So the range of our coordinates is between minus 1 and 1. That's how FastAI and PyTorch treats coordinates. The left-hand side is minus 1, or the top is minus 1, and the bottom and the right are 1. So there's no point predicting something that's smaller than minus 1 or bigger than 1, because that is not in the area that we use for our coordinates. I have a question. Uh, sure, just a moment. Um, so how does y range work? Um, well, it actually uses this function called sigmoid range, which takes the sigmoid of x, multiplies by high minus low, and adds low. And here is what sigmoid range looks like for minus 1 to 1. It's just a sigmoid where the bottom is the low and the top is the high. And so that way, all of our activations are going to be mapped to the range from minus 1 to 1. Yes, Rachel. Can you provide images with an arbitrary number of channels as inputs, specifically more than three channels? Yeah, you can have as many channels as you like. Um, we've certainly seen images with less than three, because um, we've seen grayscale. Um, more than three is common as well. Um, you could have like an infrared band, or like satellite images often have multispectral, there's some kinds of medical images where there are bands that are kind of outside the visible range. Um, your pre-trained model will generally have three channels. Um, so FastAI does some tricks to 
use three-channel pre-trained models for non-three-channel data. Um, but that's the only tricky bit. Other than that, it's just just a you know it's just an axis that happens to have four things or two things or one thing instead of three things. There's nothing um, special about it. Um, okay, we didn't specify a loss function here, so we get whatever we, it gave us, which is a MSE loss. So MSE loss is mean squared error, and that makes perfect sense, right? You would expect mean squared error to be a reasonable thing to use for regression. We're just testing how close we are um, to the target, and then taking the square, taking the mean. Uh, we didn't specify any metrics, and that's because mean squared error um, is already a good metric. Like it's not, it's 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 it has nice gradients, it behaves well, um, but and it's also the thing that we care about. So we don't need a separate metric to track. So let's go ahead and use LR find, um, and we can pick a learning rate, so maybe about ten to the minus two. And we can call fine tune, and we get a valid loss of 0 0.0001, and so that's the mean squared error. So we should take the square root. So on average, we're about 0 0.01 off in a coordinate space that goes between minus one and one. So that sounds super accurate. Uh, took about three and a bit minutes to run. Um, so we can always call in FastAI, and we always should, show results. See what our results look like. And as you can see, FastAI has automatically figured out how to display the combination of an image independent variable and a point dependent variable. On the left is the, is the target, and on the right is the prediction. And as you can see, it is pretty close to perfect. You know, one of the really interesting things here is we used fine tune, even although, think about it, the thing we're fine tuning, ImageNet, isn't even an image regression model. So we're actually fine tuning an image classification model to become something totally different, an image regression model. Um, why does that work so well? Well, because um, an ImageNet uh, classification model must have learnt a lot about kind of how images look, what things look like, and where the pieces of them are, to kind of know how to figure out what breed of animal something is, even if it's partly obscured by a bush, or it's in the shade, or it's turned in different angles. Um, you know, these um, pre-trained image models are incredibly powerful computers, you know, computing um, algorithms. So built into every ImageNet pre-trained model is all this capability that it had to learn for itself. So asking it to use that capability to figure out where something is, is just actually not that hard for it. And so that's why we can actually fine-tune um, an ImageNet classification model to create something completely different, which is a um, a point image regression model. So I find that um, incredibly cool, i got to say. So again, look at the further research after you've done the questionnaire, and uh, particularly if you haven't used data frames before, please play with them, because we're going to be using them uh, more and more. Good question. Um, I'll just do the last one. And um, also, go back and look at the bear classifier from Notebook 2, or whatever, hopefully you created some other um, classifier for your own data. Because remember we talked about how it would be better if the bear classifier could also recognize that there's no bear at all. Um, or maybe there's both a grizzly bear and a black bear, or a grizzly bear and a teddy bear. Um, so if you retrain it using multi-label classification, see what happens. Um, see how well it works when there's no bears. Um, and see whether it changes the accuracy of the single label model when you turn it into a multi-label problem. So have a fiddle around and tell us on the forum what you find. And we've got a question, Rachel. Is there a tutorial showing how to use pre-trained models on four channel images? Also, how can you add a channel to a normal image? What was the last bit? How do you add a channel to an image? I don't know what that means. Like how, like I don't know, you can't, like an image is an image, you can't add a channel to an image, is what it is. Um, 
Uh, I don't know if there's a tutorial, um, but we can certainly make sure somebody on the forum has shown how to do it. It's um, it's super straightforward. It, it should be pretty much automatic. Okay, we're going to talk about um, collaborative filtering. What is collaborative filtering? Well, think about um, on Netflix or whatever. Um, you might have watched a lot of movies that are sci-fi and have a lot of action and were made in the 70s. And um, Netflix might not know anything about the properties of movies you watched. It, it might just know that they're movies with titles and IDs. Um, but what it could absolutely see without any manual work uh, is find other people that watched the same movies that you watched. And it could see what other movies those people watched that you haven't. And it would probably find they were also, you would probably find they were also science fiction and full of action and made in the 70s. So we can use an approach where we recommend things even if we don't know anything about what those things are, as long as we know who else has uh, used or recommended things that are similar, you know, the same kind, you know, many of the same things that, that you've liked or, or, or used. Um, this doesn't necessarily mean users and products. Um, in fact, in collaborative filtering, instead of saying products, we normally say items. And items could be um, links you click on, uh, diagnoses for a patient, and so forth. So there's a key idea here, which is that in the underlying items, and we're going to be using movies in this example, there are some, um, there are some features, they may not be labeled, but there's some underlying concept of features of, um, of those movies, like the fact that there's a action concept and a sci-fi concept and a 1970s concept. Now you were never actually told Netflix you like these kinds of movies, and maybe Netflix never actually added columns to their movies saying what movies are those types. But as long as like, you know, in the real world there's this concept of sci-fi and action and movie age, and that those concepts are relevant for at least some people's movie watching decisions. As long as this is true, then we can actually uncover these, they're called lat latent factors, these things that kind of decide what kind of movies you want to watch. And they're latent because nobody necessarily ever wrote them down or labeled them or, or communicated them in any way. So let me show you what this looks like. Um, so there's a great data set we can use called Movie Lens which contains tens of millions of movie rankings. And so a movie ranking looks like this. It has a user number, a movie number, a rating, and a timestamp. So we don't know anything about who user number 196 is. I don't know if that is Rachel or Sylvain or somebody else. I don't know what movie number 242 is. I don't know if that's Casablanca or Lord of the Rings or the mask. Um, and then rating is a number between, I think it was one and five. A question. Sure. In traditional machine learning, we perform cross-validations and k-fold training to check for variance and bias trade-off. Is this common in training deep learning models as well? Um, so cross-validation is a technique where you um, don't just split your data set into one training set and one validation set, but you basically do it five or so times, like five training sets and like five validation sets representing different overlapping subsets. Um, and basically this was, this used to be done a lot um, because people often used to have not enough data to get a good result. And so um, this way, rather than kind of having 20% that you would leave out each time, you could just leave out like 10% each time. Nowadays, it's less common that we have so little data that we need to worry about 
the complexity and extra time of lots of models. It's done on Kaggle a lot. Because on Kaggle, every little fraction of a percent matters. Um, but it's not, yeah, it's not a deep learning thing or a machine learning thing or whatever. It's just a, you know, lots of data or not very much data thing. And uh, do you care about the last decimal place of improvement or not? It's not something we're going to talk about, certainly in this part of the course, if ever, um, because it's not something that comes up in practice that often as being that important. There are two more questions. What would be some good applications of collaborative filtering outside of recommender systems? Well, I mean, it depends how you define recommender system. Um, if you're trying to figure out what kind of other diagnoses might be applicable to a patient, I guess that's kind of a recommender system. Or you're trying to figure out where somebody is going to click next or whatever, it's kind of a recommender system. Um, but, you know, really conceptually, it's anything where you're trying to learn from, from past behavior, um, where that behavior is kind of like a, 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 a thing happened to an entity. What is an approach to training using video streams, i.e. from drone footage instead of images? Would you need to break up the footage into image frames? Um, in practice, quite often you would, because images just tend to be pretty big. Sorry, videos tend to be pretty big. Um, there's a lot of things. So, I mean, theoretically, uh, the time could be the, the fourth channel. Yeah, uh, or, or a fifth channel. So, fifth channel. I mean, if, if, if it's a um, full color movie, you can absolutely have, um, well, I, I guess fourth, because you, you can have, um, or it would be a, a five. Rank five tensor being batch by time by color by row by column, um, but often that's uh, too computationally and too um, memory intensive. So sometimes people just um, look at one frame at a time. Sometimes people use a, a few frames around kind of the keyframe, like three or five frames at a time. And sometimes people use something called a recurrent neural network, which we'll be seeing in the next week or two, it's treated as a sequence data. Um, yeah, there's all kinds of tricks you can do to try and, try and work with that. Conceptually, though, um, there's no reason you can't just add an additional access to your tensors and everything just work. It's just a practical issue around time and memory. And someone else noted that it's pretty fitting that you mentioned the movie The Mask. Yes, it was not an accident. Because <laughs> I've got masks on the brain. <laughs> I'm not sure if we're allowed to like that movie anymore, though. I kind of liked it when it came out. I don't know if, what I think nowadays. It's a while. Um, okay. So... Uh, let's take a look. So we can untar data ML100K. So ML100K is a small subset of the full set. Um, there's another one that we can grab, which has got the whole lot, 25 million. Um, but 100K is good enough for uh, messing around. Um, so if you look at the README, you'll find the main table. The main table is in a file called u.data. So let's open it up with read.csv again. Um, this one is actually not comma-separated values. It's tab-separated. Rather confusingly, we still use CSV and just say delimiter is a tab, backslash T is tab. Um, there's no row at the top saying what the um, columns are called, so we say header is none and then pass in a list of what the columns are called. Uh, dot head will give us the first five rows, and we mentioned just before what it looks like. Um, it's not a particularly friendly way to look at it. So what we're, I'm going to do is I'm going to um, cross-tab it. Um, and so what I've done here is I've grabbed the top, um, uh, I can't remember how many it was. Uh, well, I can see. One, two, three, four, uh, 15 or 20 movies uh, based on the most popular movies and the top bunch of users who watch the most movies. And uh, so I've basically kind of uh, reoriented this 
So for each user, I have all the movies they've watched and the rating they gave them. So empty spots represent users that have not seen that movie. Um, so this is just another way of looking at this same data. So basically what we want to do is um, guess what movies we should tell people they might want to watch. And so it's basically filling in these gaps to tell user 212, do you think we would, they might like movie 49, or 79, or 99 best to watch next? So let's assume that we actually had columns for every movie that represented, say, how much sci-fi they are, how much action they are, and how old they are. And maybe they're between minus one and one. And so like The, la the Last Skywalker is very sci-fi, fairly action, and definitely not old. Um, and then we could do the same thing for users. So we could say user one really likes sci-fi, quite likes action, and really doesn't like old. And so now if you multiply those together, and remember in PyTorch and NumPy, you have element-wise calculations, so this is going to multiply each corresponding item. It's not matrix multiplication. If you're a mathematician, don't go there. This is element-wise multiplication. If we want matrix multiplication, it would be an at sign. So if we multiply each um, element together next uh, to, with the equivalent element in the other one, uh, and then sum them up, that's going to give us a number which will basically tell us how much do these two correspond. Because remember, two negatives multiply together to get a positive. So user one likes exactly the kind of stuff that, last guy, that the last Skywalker has in it, and so we get 2.1. Multiplying things together element-wise and adding them up is called the dot product. Okay, and we use it a lot, and it's the basis of matrix, I didn't say modification, matrix multiplication. Multiplication. So make sure you know what a dot product is. It's this. So Casablanca is not at all sci-fi, not much action, and is certainly old. So if we do user 1 times Casablanca, we get a negative number. So we might think, okay, user 1 won't like, won't like this movie. Problem is, we don't know what the latent factors are, and even if we did, we don't know how to label a particular user or a particular movie with them. So we have to learn them. How do we learn them? Well, um, we can actually look at a spreadsheet, so I've got a spreadsheet version. Um, so we have a spreadsheet version, which is basically, um, what I did was I um, popped this table into Excel, and then I randomly created a, let's count this now, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. I randomly created a 15 by 5 table here, so these are just random numbers, and I randomly created a 5 by 15 table here, and I basically said, okay, well let's just pretend, let's just assume that every movie and every user has five latent factors, I don't know what they are, and let's then do a matrix multiply of this set of factors by this set of factors. And a matrix multiply of a row by a column is identical to a dot product of two vectors. So that's why I can just use matrix multiply. So this is just what this first cell contains. So they, they then copied it to the whole thing. So all these numbers there are being calculated from the row latent factors dot product with, or matrix multiply with, the column latent factors. So in other words, I'm doing exactly this calculation, but I'm doing them with random numbers. And so that gives us a whole bunch um, of values, right? And then what I could do is I could calculate a loss by comparing every one of these numbers here to every one of these numbers here, 
and then I could do mean squared error. And then I could use stochastic gradient descent to find the best set of numbers in each of these two locations. And that is what collaborative filtering is. So that's actually all we need. So um, rather than doing an Excel, um, and show you the Excel version later if you're interested, because we can actually do this whole thing and it works in Excel. Um, let's jump and do it into um, PyTorch. Now one thing that might just make this more fun is actually to know what the movies are, and MovieLens tells us in u.item what the movies are called, um, and that uses the telemeter of the pipe sign, weirdly enough. Um, so here are, the, here are the names of each movie. And so one of the nice things about pandas is it can do um, joins, just like SQL. And so you can use the merge method to combine the ratings table and the movies table, and since they both have a column called movie, by default it will join on those. And so now here we have the ratings table with actual movie names. So that's going to be a bit more fun. We don't need it for modeling, but it's just going to be better for looking at stuff. So um, we could use Datablocks API at this point, uh, or we can just use the built-in application factory method. Um, since it's there, we may as well use it. So we can create a collaborative filtering data loaders object from a data frame by passing in the ratings table. Um, by default, the user column is called user, and ours is, so fine. Um, by default, the item column is called item, and ours is not. It's called title, so let's pick title and choose a batch size. And so if we now say show batch, here is some of that data. Uh, and the rating is called rating by default, so that worked fine too. So here's some data. So um, we need to now create our, um, let's assume we're going to use that five numbers of factors. Uh, so the number of users is however many classes there are for user, and the number of movies is however many classes there are for title. And so these are um, So we don't just have a vocab now, right? We've actually got um, a list of classes for each categorical variable, for each set of discrete choices. So we've got a whole bunch of users, uh, 944, uh, and a whole bunch of titles, 1,635. So for our randomized latent factor parameters, we're going to need to create those matrices. So we can just create them with random numbers. So this is normally distributed random numbers. That's what rand n is. And that will be n users, okay, so 944, by n factors, which is 5. So that's exactly the same as this, except this is just 15. So let's do exactly the same thing for movies. Random numbers, n movies by 5. Okay, and so to calculate the result for some movie and uh, some user, we have to look up the index of the movie in our movie latent factors, the index of the user in our user latent factors, and then do a cross product. Um, so in other words, we would say like, oh, okay, so for this particular combination, we would have to look up that numbered user over here, and that numbered movie over here to get the two uh, appropriate sets of latent factors. Um, but this is a problem because um, lookup in an index is not um, a, a linear model. Like remember our deep learning models really only know how to just um, multiply matrices together and do simple element-wise nonlinearities like ReLU. There isn't a thing called lookup in an index. Um, okay, I'll just finish this bit. Um, here's a cool thing though. The lookup in an index is actually can be represented as a matrix product, believe it or not. So if you replace our indices with one hot encoded vectors, then a one hot encoded vector 
times something is identical to looking up in an index. And let me show you. So if we grab um, so if we call the one hot function, that creates a, as it says here, one hot encoding, and we're going to one hot encode the value three with n users classes. And so n users, as we've discussed, is 944, right? Then so if we go one hot, one hot encoding the number three into n users, one hot three. We get this big array, big tensor, and as you can see in index 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, we have a 1, and the size of that is 944. So if we then multiply that by user factors, so user factors, remember, is that um, random matrix of this size. So what's going to happen? So we're going to go 0 by the first row, and so that's going to be all zeros, and then we're going to go 0 again, and then we're going to 0 again, and then we're going to finally go 1, right, uh, on the index 3 row, and so it's going to return each of them, and then we'll go back to 0 again. So if we do that, remember at sign is matrix multiply, and compare that to user factors 3. Same thing. Isn't that crazy? So um, it's a kind of weird, inefficient way to do it, right? But matrix multiplication is a way to index into an array. And this is the thing that we know how to do SGD with, and we know how to build models with. Yeah. So it turns out that anything that we can do with indexing to array, we now have a way to optimize. And we have a question. Uh, there are two questions. Uh, one, how different in practice is collaborative filtering with sparse data compared to dense data? Uh, we are not doing sparse data in this course, but there's an excellent uh, course I hear <laughs> called Computational Linear Algebra for Coders. It has a lot of information about sparse. The fast AI course. Um, second question: In practice, do we tune the number of latent factors? Absolutely, we do. Yes, um, it's just a it's just a number of um, filters, just like we have in much any kind of uh, deep learning model. All right, so now that we know that um, the procedure of finding out which latent set of latent factors is the right thing, looking something up in an index, is the same as uh, matrix multiplication with a one-hot vector. Um, oh, I already had it over here. Um, we can go ahead and build a model with that. So basically, if we do this for a whole for a few indices at once, then we have a matrix of one hot encoded vectors. So the whole thing is just one big matrix multiplication. Um, now the thing is, as I said, this is a pretty inefficient way to to do an index lookup. So there is a computational shortcut, which is called an embedding. An embedding is a layer that um, has the computational speed of an array lookup uh, and the same gradients as a matrix multiplication. Um, how does it do that? Well, just internally, it uses an index lookup to actually grab the values, um, and it also knows what the gradient of a matrix multiplication by a one-hot encoded vec uh, vector is, uh, or matrix is, um, without having to go to all this trouble. Uh, and so an embedding 
is a matrix multiplication with a one hot encoded vector where you never actually have to create the one hot encoded vector. You just need the indexes. This is important to remember because a lot of people have heard about embeddings and they think they're something special and magical, and, and they're absolutely not. You can do exactly the same thing by creating a one hot encoded matrix and doing a matrix multiply. It is just a computational shortcut, nothing else. I often find when I talk to people about this in person, I have to tell them this six or seven times <laughs> before they believe me, um, because they think embeddings are something more clever, um, and they're not. They're just a computational shortcut to do a matrix multiplication more quickly uh, with a one hot encoded matrix by instead doing an array lookup. Okay, so let's try and create a collaborative filtering model. Um, in PyTorch, a model or an architecture, uh, or really an nn.module, um, is a class. Uh, so to use PyTorch to its fullest, you need to understand object-oriented programming because we have to create classes. Um, there's a lot of tutorials about this, so I won't go into detail about it, um, but I'll give you a quick overview. A class could be something like dog or resnet or circle, and it's something that has some data attached to it and it has some functionality attached to it. Here's a class called example. Um, the data it has attached to it is A, and the functionality attached to it is say, and so we can, for example, create an instance of this class, an object of this type example. We pass in Sylvain, so Sylvain will now be in ex.a, and we can then say ex.say, and it will call say, and it will say, passing in nice to meet you, so that will be x, and so it'll say hello self.a, so that's Sylvain, nice to meet you. Here it is. Okay. Um, so in Python, the way you create a class is to say class in its name, then to say what is passed to it when you create that object. It's a special method called dunder init. As we've briefly mentioned before, in Python there are all kinds of special method names that have special behavior. They start with two underscores, they end with two underscores, and we pronounce that dunder, so dunder init. Um, all um, methods in, uh, all, all regular methods, instance methods in Python, always get past the actual object itself first, so we normally call that self, and then optionally anything else. And so you can then change the contents of the current object by just setting self.whatever to whatever you like. So after this, self.a is now equal to Sylvain. So we call a method, same thing, it's past self, optionally anything you pass to it, and then you can access the contents of self which you stashed away back here when we initialized it. Um, so that's basically how object or you know the basics of object-oriented programming works in Py in Python. Um, there's something else you can do when you create a new class, which is you can pop something in parentheses after its name. And that means we're going to use something called inheritance. And what inheritance means is I want to have all the functionality of this class, plus I want to add some additional functionality. So a module is a PyTorch class, um, which FastAI has customized. Um, so it's kind of a FastAI version of a PyTorch class. Um, and probably in the next course, we'll see exactly how it works. Um, and, um, but it looks a lot like a, it acts almost exactly like a, just a regular Python class. We have an init, um, and we can set attributes to whatever we like, and one of the things we can use is an embedding, and so an embedding is just this class that does what I just described. A, um, it's the same as a, as a linear layer uh, with a one hot encoded matrix, but it does it with this computational shortcut. So you can say how many, in this case, users are there, and how many factors will they have. Now, there is one very special thing about things that inherit from module, which is that when you call them, it will actually call a method called forward. So forward is a special PyTorch method name, it's the most important 
PyTorch method name. This is where you put the the actual computation. So to um, to grab the factors from an embedding, we just call it like a function, right? So this is going to get passed here the um, user IDs and the movie IDs as two columns. So let's grab the zero index column and grab the embeddings by passing them to user factors. And then we'll do the same thing for the index one column, that's the movie IDs, pass them to the movie factors. And then here, there's our element-wise multiplication, and then sum. And now remember, we've got another dimension this time. The first axis is the um, mini-batch dimension. So we want to sum over the other dimension, the index one dimension. So that's going to give us a dot product for each um, user. Uh, sorry, for each rating, for each user movie combination. So this is the dot product class. So um, you can see if we look at one batch of our data, it's of, si of si uh, shape 64 by 2 because there are 64 items in the mini batch and each one has, uh, this is the independent variables, so it's got the user ID and the movie ID. And Do deep neural network based models for collaborative filtering work better than more traditional approaches like SVG or other matrix? Let's wait until we get there. <laughs> so here's X, right? So here is one user ID, movie ID combination. Okay? And then for each one of those 64, Here are the ratings. So now uh, we've created a dot product module from scratch, so we can instantiate it, passing in the number of users, the number of movies, and let's use 50 factors. And now we can create a learner. Now this time we're not creating a CNN learner or a specific application learner, it's just a totally generic learner. So this is a learner that doesn't really know how to do anything clever, it just stores away the data you give it, and the model you give it, and so since we're not using an application-specific learner, it doesn't know what loss function to use, so we'll tell it to use MSE. And fit. And that's it, right? So we've just fitted our own collaborative filtering model where we literally created the entire architecture, it's a pretty simple one, from scratch. So that's pretty amazing. Um, now the results aren't great, if you look at the movie lens data set benchmarks uh, online, you'll see this is not actually a great result. So one of the things we should do is take advantage of um, the tip we just mentioned earlier in this lesson, which is when you're doing regression, which we are here, right? The number between one and five is like a continuous value, we're trying to get as close to it as possible. Um, we should tell um, FastAI what the range is. So we can use Y range as before. So here's exactly the same thing, we've got a Y range, we've stored it away, and then at the end we use, as we discussed, sigmoid range, passing in, and look here, we pass in star self dot Y range, that's going to pass in by default 0, 0,5.5. And so we can see, yeah, not really any better. Um, it's worth a try. Normally this is a little bit better, but it always depends on when you run it. I'll just run it a second time while it's we're looking. Um, now there is something else we can do though, which is that if we look back at our little Excel version, the thing is here, um, when we multiply you know, these latent factors by these latent factors and add them up, it's not really taking account of the fact that this user may just rate movies really badly in general, regardless of what kind of movie they are. And this movie might be just a great movie in general, just everybody likes it, regardless of what kind of stuff they like. And so it'd be nice to be able to represent this directly. 
And we can do that using something we've already learned about, which is bias. We could have another single number for each movie, which we just add, and another single number for each user, which we just add, right? And we've already seen this for linear models, you know, this idea that it's nice to be able to add a bias value. So let's do that. So that means that we're going to need another embedding for each user, which is a size one. It's just a single number we're going to add. So in other words, it's just an array lookup. But remember, to do an array lookup that we can kind of take a gradient of, we have to say embedding. So we'll do the same thing for movie bias. And so then all of this is identical as before, and we just add this one extra line, which is to add the user and movie bias values. And so let's train that, see how it goes. Well, that was a shame, it got worse. So we used to have, that finished here, 0 0.87, 0 0.88, 0 0.89, so it's, it's a little bit worse. Um, why is that? Well, if you look earlier on, it was quite better, it was 0.86. So it's, um, it's overfitting very quickly. Um, and so what we need to do is we need to find a way that we can train more epochs without overfitting. Now we've already learned about data augmentation, right? Like rotating images and changing their brightness and color and stuff. But it's not obvious how we would do data augmentation for collaborative filtering, right? So how are we going to make it so that we can train lots of epochs without overfitting? And to do that, we're going to have to use something called regularization. And regularization is a set of techniques which basically allow us to use models with lots of parameters and train them for a long period of time, um, but penalize them effectively for overfitting, uh, or in some way cause them to, to try to stop overfitting. And so that is what we will uh, look at next week. Okay, well thanks everybody. Um, so there's a lot to take in there, so please remember to practice, to experiment, to listen to the um, lessons again, um, because uh, you know for the next couple of lessons things are going to uh, really quickly build on top of all the stuff that we've learned. So please be as comfortable as it, with it as you can. Feel free to go back and, and re-listen and go through and, and follow through the notebooks and then try to recreate as much of them yourself. Thanks everybody, and I will see you next week, or see you in the next lesson whenever you watch it.